Judith, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> so I just finished reading your latest book, The, uh, the Reindeer Chronicles, and it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, there's, there's kind of, um, whenever people ask me about um, like what, 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 what's like a good book to kind of, um, you know, for people who are interested in, in regenerative agriculture or permaculture or just something to, to not make them depressed. Um, I've been sending people to um, one of my favorites so far is uh, um, Dan Flores' book, uh, American Serengeti. Um, uh, Sally Fallon has a great one called Nourishing Diets. Uh, I've, I've read, there's another one, um, Dark Emu. Uh, and like a lot of these books, like they, they kind of, they're, they're capturing, you know, stories about, about the, um, how productive and um, just amazing the ecosystems were, you know, 200, 300 years ago. Um, and uh, as, and it's kind of this, like this beacon of like hope of like, we could return to that, you know, if, if we, we, um, you know, come to our senses. And what I love about your book is, is that it's like, it's people who are doing that. It's people who have come to their senses and they are, they are, you know, rebuilding, regenerating the, the, the ecological abundance that we, we have lost in the last, you know, few hundred years. Um, and it's, it's, it's just amazing. I, 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 I know I should have, I, I, I shouldn't have been as, as, as surprised as, as I am now, like, you know, knowing the, the past work that you've done, but um, it was, I, I when, whenever I listen to books, I, it's quite often it's in the vehicle when I'm driving, and I had to pull over on the road several times to like write down. Oh my God, this is this was amazing. And um, so I guess to, to start off with, um, tell me a bit about the like why you wrote the book. Uh, what was because you, you've you've done quite a lot of other projects. What was the spark that kind of set this this latest one off? Yeah, it was a funny thing because I didn't feel like writing another book. I felt. I wanted to do something, but I didn't know what form that would take because what I know how to do is write books. <laughs> so as it turned out, I had been kind of building, I'd been researching and reporting the book long yeah. before I decided to do it. Yeah. But what prompted me is that I often get kind of frustrated by what's missing from the larger conversations. Yeah. And so what two things that I felt really strongly were missing. One is the role of functioning ecosystems yeah. in climate regulation, because everything that people were talking about had to do with greenhouse gases. And yes. that's kind of one set of opportunities and challenges and reasons for worries and kind of, but I felt that it was keeping our collective yeah. heads in this very kind of narrow space when climate is everywhere. Climate happens whenever the sun hits, strikes the earth, you know, yeah. like what happens to that solar radiation and what happens with that solar radiation, whether it is determined by the presence of life, by the ecosystem yeah. that, is the, that is the spot, is, is in that area. Yeah. And you mentioned there, there was another one. So there's, it was the kind of the, the myopic focus on greenhouse gases in terms of, you know, the ecological problems we're facing today. And what was the other kind of driver that, that got you in? The other is that the notion that we, well, it's, it's what you said, that, that the, the understanding that not only were our landscapes more abundant in the past, but that they can be abundant yeah. again. So whenever we look at, at the world around us, we tend to think that it always looked that way. I mean, that's just human nature. So the understanding that we can enhance our landscapes, improve them, just, it, it just, it needed to be said. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, and, and like the, what I, what I really loved about your book is like, um, I'd say about half of the the kind of stories that you highlighted, I was quite familiar with. You know, like the um, the 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 Lus Plateau and John D. Liu's work, um, the work that Neil Spackman's been doing, uh, and there's a few other projects as well. But the you 
the the way that you presented it, it was like they were wholly like you went to a whole other level of of depth and 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 the the research that you did and the um, that um, yeah, it was it was it was really enlightening to to kind of uh, take a deeper dive. Um, and of course, there's a, a ton of, of new ones that um, I, I actually want to. Hopefully, we can we can cover some of them today. That were some of my personal favorites. Um, but the, just coming back to your the 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 first reason you gave for writing the book, which was the this this narrow focus on on carbon in terms of you know uh, the you know the problems that we're facing today. Um, I was I was actually shocked when you like right at the beginning of the book when you, you kind of gave that as as a reason for um, I think this this was a I might be paraphrasing you um, but you said that said like billions are spent on kind of models and and you know geoengineering plans um, but the, but there's there's almost nothing is spent on ecosystem restoration and which is like it's when when you look at how how impactful the the latter is like we could we could have accomplished all of our goals had we actually just you know not been spending money on all these models where if you get one variable wrong you know you're you're totally out to lunch um and um like so i i was i was really relieved that 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 somebody finally said it that it's like <laughs> let's 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 get over this this just whatever it is, this fascination with carbon and realize that there's a lot of other things that we could do that would accomplish the same things that don't require us to, you know, um, you know, these, these crazy schemes of, you know, ejecting stuff into the atmosphere to re reflect the sun's light or, you know, pumping carbon with literally with pumps into the ground, <laughs> which trees do that naturally. Like it's, it really is quite silly. And so I'm, I'm, grateful that somebody of your caliber came out and said it and and then documented like the, why we why what what can happen when we when we get past that that focus on on carbon well the wonderful thing is that i think that the change is happening yeah without it being necessarily articulated as such you know, maybe um, it's my bias because I, you see what you're looking for, what yeah. you're thinking about, but I'm seeing more and more talk about ecosystem restoration. And of course, we're about to enter the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. Yeah. So a lot of UN components are getting involved in that and yeah. promoting it. Yeah. Yeah. Um so the the I've I've got a bunch of notes here that I kind of wanted to go through just sure. some of the 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 big ideas that really stood out to me in the book and um, and so the the first one was this this idea of of um, you know billions being spent on models and and nothing's being you know spent or very little is being spent on ecosystem despite the the huge returns on on the projects that where money has been invested like in uh, um, the Lost Plateau in in China which we'll talk about in a minute. But the, the other kind of thing that I, I really enjoyed in your introduction was you talked about how uh, too often activism is framed as being against something as opposed to being for something. And so I just wanted to get your, your kind of thoughts about, about that, um, that nuance there. Yeah. So it becomes a kind of, you know, who's right, who's wrong, winners, losers. Yeah. And then that, again, that locks us. Yeah. In to this paradigm when rather than seeing where we all can benefit, it's a it's it creates kind of this defensiveness. So another way that uh, like tons of money, tons of kind of psychological capital, <laughs> psychic cap capital has been spent is has been in the whole thing of you know, climate deniers, you know, so like tons of research on what do people think about the climate? You know, do, do people think climate change is happening? I mean, ultimately it's kind of all irrelevant. I mean, if we, however, if we look at the land around us, people are engaged yeah. with their landscapes. Yeah, and it's like one of my favorite cartoons, I'm sure you've seen it is, is um, it's this guy on a stage and he's giving this presentation about all the benefits um, of, you know, like what can happen if, if we were to invest in kind of, you know, you know, green technologies and regenerative agriculture. And he's got all these, these benefits, you know, clean air, clean water, um, you know, higher, higher, um, 
uh, you know, states of, um, uh, of income and all these just different benefits. And, he, and he's got these graphs and charts behind him and somebody in the audience stands up and he says, yeah, but what if this whole thing is a big hoax and we, and we, we, uh, we fix the climate for nothing. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like, like what are the things that we could do? And so like, like for, for the, for the record. And one of the reasons why I'm, I, I was, I was really glad to see, um, you basically saying is like, we don't have to die on this hill of carbon is it, it, it totally circumvents that whole conversation about, um, you know, that's going back and forth in, in the media and has been for, I don't know, like when did Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth come out? That was 2001, wasn't it? 2006, I 2006, think. 2006, yeah. So I mean, like, you know, 15 years it, it's been out and, and people have just been battling over this, this stuff left and right when it's like, yeah, but even if it isn't, even if it's true or not, what are the things that we could do today that would benefit us regardless? And there's lots that we could do. <laughs> yeah, that's right there. And that's, that's what I, uh, I love about it. So, um, and, and I, I also like the, your, your point about activism being, you know, it's framed as like, you have to like fight something is like when I first you know, got into this stuff, you know, cause I saw all the problems that were in the world. That's what I did. I started going to protests and rallies and, and it was a very, um, uh, it was kind of, it was, there was a lot of adrenaline rush, but like, it was like, you were running into a brick wall and like, you weren't accomplishing anything. It wasn't enjoyable. And I was starting to get bitter and people around me were starting to hate being around me because I was, you know, very condescending and basically a, a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and um and I, I don't know what the 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 shifting point was in my life but i decided like 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 there's so many other ways that we can we can you know fix these problems um and and one of them was like okay well i'm dependent upon these systems right now and so it's like like me going to these protests and like you know fighting these things is like i'm trying to pick myself up by my own bootstraps it's like it's you can't do it you know bill moss and the founder of permaculture said that um, you know, the, the fundamental problem with all revolutions is that they're utterly dependent upon the system they're trying to over, overthrow. And so it's like, we, let's not, you know, get stuck criticizing the world and, and fighting things. Um, let's focus on, on the good that we can benefit and, and use kind of the, the carrot and, and, and incentives to bring people in. And I, I really appreciate that in the introduction, it kind of set the stage for all the other stories that you you told throughout the book of, of these people. Cause I'm sure they also had similar insights that they, they were sick of just, you know, fighting the man and they just wanted to, to go out and do it. And, and, uh, but like I said, that was, is that what you found when you were you know interviewing some of the, the people that you featured in the book was, was there kind of a common origin story um, between all of them or, or were they, was it, was it quite different? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I think a lot has to do with temperament. So some people are temperamentally kind of not comfortable with the adversary yeah. approach. And some people want to just do something yeah. differently. And, and I would put myself in that category. I've in a very small way done some of that you know, placard holding, um, but ultimately that's, that's not, that doesn't stay in comfortable for long. Not that yeah. one should always do something that makes you comfortable, but led me to find other ways. And for me, writing yeah. has always been that way. Yeah. Well, and for me, it's like, like, I think you're right. The conflict is, is not necessarily a bad thing, but like the, the shift for me was like, okay, I just spent you know, three months preparing or like organizing this protest. And we, we got like all these signatures and we did all this stuff and we went and like presented it to our MP and he just said, thanks. And like, nothing ever happened. And it was like, okay, well, what if, what if those, you know, a couple of thousand people that spent those months getting, what, what if we just went out and planted trees? What if we just went out and, you know, regenerated a water, uh, a water cycle? It's like, like, could we have gotten to our, our goal, which was, you know, ecosystem restoration and, and, you know, clean air and clean water faster than like trying to like, <laughs> you know, force the system to, it's just like, it's a, it was a funny, um, I mean, the, the word hypocritical comes to mind too. Cause it's just like, like, 
we all, you know, drove to these protests and the signs that we're holding are, <laughs> you know, right. made, in, made in pulp mills. And, and it's like, like, not to say that, um, like we can't, like you said, you know, criticize these systems, but um, it was just, it was way more enjoyable and, and I think productive for, for me when I made that shift. And um, yeah, I was just curious if, if other people in the, um, that you never, that you interviewed, interviewed had the same kind of transition point for them. Well, I mean, you know, it, it reminds me of um, one example of um, um, Beth Robinette, Robinette, um, oh, yeah. a um, holistic grazer who in Eastern Washington state, who helped run the new cowgirl camp and the new rancher camp, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of an, which I wrote about, which was a blast, kind of an immerse, immersion yeah. <laughs> experience into ranching. And she said that, you know, she saw like she grew up on a holistically managed ranch and mm. just saw how, how it, well it worked and saw many ranchers nearby who were struggling and their land was getting worse and all of this and, and tr trying to convince other people. Yeah. So that's kind of like, not quite adversarial, but it's like, I have the answer. I want, yeah. you know, you should do this. She said that never worked. No. Better to go and work with people who are open. Cause yeah. she said she would talk to her peers yeah. who, when she explained what holistic management was that it was working with natural processes, mimicking the dynamic of grazing animals and predators that they would immediately get it. Yeah. And so th there was no force that was needed. Yeah. It was all the force that was exhausting her. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good way of putting it is that that's, and that's, that's the sense. It was like just, tr you know, pushing it, pushing at a closed door when there's, there's all these other doors around that are just you know, wide open and there's people that are, are looking, actively looking for this stuff. Um, so that, yeah, I, I, I really appreciated that in the, in the, in, in the introduction. Um, and then the, the other, uh, the, the other uh, point that I really enjoyed, and this is kind of getting into the introduction too, is, was um, you kind of laid out what were some of the, um, the common kind of characteristics in, in all of these these you know individuals that you you were sharing stories of, of how they have you know regenerated ecosystems and um, and you have this line it was like they they were looking for the the positive outliers not for averages and I just wanted to, can you explain that that a bit because I think it's a really interesting concept yeah um, I'm thinking that that was an observation that I got from Peter Donovan of the Soil Carbon Coalition. Okay, yeah. And when I first met him in, oh my goodness, I think we're talking almost, it could be 10 years now. Anyway, he, it, there was the Soil Carbon Challenge. So, yeah. because what he said is that if you're going to have a race, you don't like, see what you know like you look yeah. for the outlier yeah. who, 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 <laughs> yeah, who exactly. does this you know like the average doesn't matter yeah. and you know sometimes and I, I hear this from a lot of people in the regenerative agriculture movement that if someone gets tremendous yields or trem whether it's tremendous increases in soil carbon whether it's um, tremendous biodiversity or tremendous crop yields People say, well, that kind of lies outside of our frame. Something weird must be going on. So yeah. let's not count that. Yeah. As opposed to, wow, when someone's doing something very, someone gets very different results. Let's see what they're doing because yeah. there may be a clue there yeah. as to what others can do. Yeah. And and I think that that really, you know, captures a lot of the, the kind of entrepreneurship and and um, you know, inquisitiveness that a lot of the, the kind of, um, I don't think you use this term, but, um, uh, Nicole Masters, uh, she just wrote uh, a book as well. And I had her on the podcast and one of the terms she used in her book for all these kind of ecosystem, you know, engineering folks is she calls them the, uh, the, the, the re re regenerators. Mm -hmm. That's the term that she used. And I, I like that. <clears throat> I like that term, despite my stutter, making it difficult <laughs> to, to stay. Uh, but, the, um, 
the there's definitely a um an aspect of like you you have to just not accept you know the existing paradigm or like this is this is how it is and um and it's funny that like that you like you said like science throws out those things or or, or you know we're taught to throw out the outliers versus in in this ecosystem engineering we want to okay what what's like the what are the floods and the droughts and like those are the years that you you want to learn from you know how did your land respond to when you had too much water or when you didn't have enough you don't want to you know we, we get 12 inches of rain on average but like some years it's two and some years it's 24 <laughs> you know right. and um yeah it's it's an interesting uh i don't know what the word it's like it's a a condition within agriculture um, and I get a lot of other fields where, where we, we miss a lot of the value there. Right. And, and, and how do you, how do you promote innovation unless yeah. you're listening to people who are innovating? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so now the, um, now we can actually, I, I want to dive into some of the, the folks that you featured in the, the book and uh, the first one that you started out with was the 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 Los Plateau. Or, is that, am I pronouncing that correctly? I think so. Los Plateau so. in in China, mm -hmm. and so um, can you just give folks like a quick um, you know elevator pitch of like what the the Los Plateau project was? Yeah, yeah. So so the Los Plateau is the region in north central China that was not only the breadbasket of China, but where China, but where agriculture in China developed around the same time. I mean, we're talking like 10,000 years ago, around the same time as it did in the Fertile Crescent. Yeah. And after, you know, literally millennia of farming, you know, like some poor practices kind of took hold and the land was incredibly degraded, which meant that millions of people were in dire poverty, literally living in caves. Yeah. And that very mineral rich, but kind of dusty, friable soil was blowing off and running off during rainfalls and the Yellow River was silting up and it was a big disaster. Yeah. Um, they called the Yellow River China's sorrow. So, yeah. you know, the whole region was awful. So, you know, the Chinese government said, okay, we can, you know, continue to respond to crises like perpetually, or maybe we can do something different and work to restore the watershed. So they did this in a huge top down way, yeah. employing all the all the impoverished villagers to create terraces, to plant trees, to plant crops, to um, manage their cattle differently. So, you know, holistic planned grazing is, a, so in many contexts and depending on the management, grazing animals are pivotal yeah. to restoring landscapes. In this case, they were letting the animals just roam freely. So you'd have like a hillside where there was maybe like one little shrub and the goats there eating it, at, you know? So like, you know, it was like these, it, there, it, it wasn't working. So they, so yeah. they took the animals off the land and did pen feeding, which again, in other contexts would not be a favorable thing to yeah. do. So anyway, the amazing thing is that John D. Liu, um, happened to be photographing that and filming that. And, you know, it was almost a fluke that he was invited to film it in the beginning. He said that, you know, it never would have occurred to him to film this because no one ever thought anything would really happen. <laughs> but he did have film of the early, early going. And then we can see how over a period of 15 years, what had been just dusty and brown and barren became green and lush and full of life. I yeah. mean, that's not a long time. No, it, it's just, it, and, and what really shocked me, because I, I, I was, again, I was familiar with, with the, the, you know, John, the, the story of the Lost Plateau and the regeneration and stuff. But like the, in your book, you talk about how the cost of this restoration worked out to um, $7 per acre. 
it, it was seventeen dollars per acre per year. Oh, so it was seventeen. Mm -hmm. But think, you know, yeah. you think about that. It's mind blowing. It's, it is mind blowing. And so, like, like for for context, uh, like in our area, which is you know, we're in central Alberta. You know, like we grow a lot of wheat, canola, um, you know, barley, cereal grains and stuff like that. Most guys put on like 50 or 100 pounds of nitrogen and nitrogen is 50 cents a pound. So every year, every acre gets $50 worth of nitrogen every single year, just in nitrogen, let alone the fuel cost and the, her the herbicides and everything else. Um and so, like, and this was this was a massive acre um, size project. I can't remember. Was it in the was it in the millions of acres or? Ooh, you know the way it's often described is as the size of Belgium. So the <laughs> whole Los Plateau is the size of France. Yeah. But the study area where they they yeah. did this work was the size of Belgium, yeah. which might even be. I should look that up. It might even be the size of the state of Vermont, which yeah. where I live. That's huge, and. And so the, you know, the, uh, apart from the, you know, the ecological benefits, um, you know, that you mentioned the book, um, there were a lot of um, really shocking in, uh, um, economic improvements as well. Like you, you, you um, mentioned a couple of stories about the, you know, families who were, like you said, literally living in like mud holes in the ground and, you know, they were 10 X or hundred Xing their income within a few years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the hardship of these people yeah. were, I mean, you know, people coming to these little, this little area, this gully um, where people, where John was interviewing them oh, and, yeah. you know, they had moved in early in their lives, you know, on foot with their parents and grandparents and like half the family died within the first year. I mean, you know, these stories are unbelievable. And then you see photos of you know healthy looking children with really good teeth you know in a school and you know you see the bright faces and yeah um yeah. life changed a lot quickly and so the one of the um the other stories i'm just remembering now i, I think it was the lost plateau and i can't remember the the name of them there was some dutch um uh finance guy that, that he was he was kind of in charge oh, of the that. world bank was yeah. it the world bank person yeah I, I think so but you you were you told the story about how like the the initial idea for how to regenerate this entire massive area came from an observation of this outlying valley or something wasn't it where like people have been yes. trying to like plant trees with oh trees don't grow here anymore because they're this like shifting baseline right. syndrome had just been like people had forgotten what it was like but then here was this amazing ecosystem that was fully functional. And this, this guy, was it from the, the World Bank? Saw right. this. Jürgen Vongoli. He, I yeah. mean, he said that they were, they were in despair, just just because the World Bank was a, a major supporter of, this, of the whole project, that they were going around the region and just you know, looking for signs of hope, just how, how do we do this? Yeah. And as it turned out, in this small village, they had removed the animals. They had removed the goats and sheep. Oh, yeah. And so, so the the when they planted trees, I think there were some kind of nut trees. Yeah. That um, walnut trees, I think they were. That with the animals moving around without being managed. Yeah. The trees never got a chance to grow. So yeah. that's, it was that simple difference, but yeah, it was pretty dramatic that him, that him and his team, you know, were, like I said, full of despair, you know, like there's no hope here. There's no life in, in these hills. And then seeing this area of green and yeah. learning what was being done that was different. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's like, those are the outliers. The average was desert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was the positive outlier that was like, yeah, this is what's possible here. Um, that's yeah, that's that's so fascinating. Um, and so the um, um, moving on to um, uh, another one of the uh, the um, the projects that you you featured, um, and this was um, Ramis and um, uh, Ramis. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, Ramis, and uh, you were talking about some of the the regeneration 
that um, again, looking in terms of like these, these like positive outliers or like um, signs that that things could be different or, or much better than, than the way they are. Um, I found it fascinating. You talked about um, Ramis and, and Jeff Lawton using uh, some of the ancient uh, Arabic uh, poetry um, from books like even the Quran, uh, where there's like verses where they, where they were describing regions of what they used to be like. And, and they actually use that as a way to like reverse engineer these ecosystems, um, you know, several thousand years after th that, that text had been written. And it was like, this kind of gave you this blueprint of like what to plant and what could be there, even though it was a desert now, you know, there were, um, you know, palm trees and date trees and, and vines growing up them. And um, yeah, it's just fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Ramis is a really interesting guy. So he's an American who converted to, I guess, you know, he, um, I don't know if he was an active Christian or as many Americans kind of by default. And then he, he converted to Islam and he's very much a student of Islamic philosophy and poetry. I mean, he inhabits it. I remember the first time that I met him, I mean, we just like ended up getting in this conversation about poetry and philosophy. And, you know, I think I had jet lag and like, you know, what did, how did we get here? Um, so yeah, that, that a student, okay, a couple of things that a student, so he, he was working in Yemen. He really has a very profound connection to Yemen. And he knows that where he, the particular valley, the Hadramut, Valley, um, that that has a very rich history in, you know, like, you know, Muhammad's family and anyway, all, all, all of this. And that someone brought a book of poetry and that had descriptions of what was growing there. And it, it, Islamic poetry is very kind of plant, it's very floral, very plant forward. And, and what he was also, and also in that tradition, there's a lot of discussion of oases. And Ramis came to understand that oases are really kind of, you know, food forests, um, you know, an agroforestry project, and that they yeah. were composed. I think that culturally, we think of oases as sort of like these magic little you know apparitions of green but they were very consciously planted yeah. and the understanding of what grew there can help guide restorations in these regions i mean the tragedy is that he had to stop the training because of war um, in yemen yeah um, yeah um Yes, it's so amazing. The, I mean, when we think about, like, you know, I use the term shifting baseline syndrome, and just like the importance of, of, you know, keeping historical documents of, of, you know, what, you know, what things were like, because like with, without that, like, you, you might think, well, this has always been a desert, like, you know, if, if we didn't know that, you know, Lebanon used to have cedars covering its slopes. It just well, it, it that's that's you know it's always been a desert, and um, and we would we could miss out on on this potential that we actually have the ability to destroy ecosystems, but also the ability to regenerate them to what they, right. what they were. And and that's one thing. Um, another person in that chapter on deserts that I um, interviewed is Neil Spackman, yeah. who I, of course has done wonderful, wonderful work on showing what's possible in a hyper arid environment. So what that I thought in Western Saudi Arabia was very interesting is that he made a point of talking to people who were older. Yeah. And he learned that over, let's say the age of 60, a person, those people tended to remember that there was always a place when they were children, there was a place that their family could go that was always green and always had water. Wow. You know, which is not, was not available to people, no. you know, in a contemporary sense. <clears throat> no. And it's, it's like one of the, um, one of the exercises that um, I think has been most powerful for, for myself and, and I, I give it to all my students and, and clients is, 
is um, wherever they like wherever they live in the world, I tell them, okay, um, to understand your biome, try to find like the the healthiest, most advanced ecosystem that's in your area, like and that's closest to you. And this could be, you know, a national park. It could be, you know, a, a river valley that's in the corner of somebody's field, but just something that hasn't been touched for a long time. And it kind of represents, you know, you, you can look back in ecological time and it's like, go and spend a couple hours in there, you know, dig into the soil, uh, notice the, the temperature differential. Like when you walk into a forest on a, on a 30 degree day, or if you're in a meadow and like the, the sound, like, and then, and then compare that to your land, wherever you are. And it's like, that's like, like, that's the teacher right there. And like, like, you know, the, there was, um, and I, I'll, I'll be careful here because the, um, there's, there's, there is this, this sense. And you mentioned it that like, these, you know, these oases, they weren't just naturally occurring. They were actually created, they were planted. And, and, and you know, just like, you know, Dan Flores's book, you know, American Serengeti, um, you know, these, these amazingly productive ecosystems, you know, the rainforest, um, th th there's now, you know, pretty good research to show that these weren't just randomly occurring ecosystems that were, you know, that were dripping with, with food and, and, and everything they were being, they were actively managed. It was, it was an agriculture that these indigenous people had, had been managing for sometimes tens of thousands of years. Um, but even without that management, um, there are places that I can go into on my farm that have better soil, you know, um, better fo uh, photosynthetic capacity. Uh, there's more biodiversity and like, and it's, and there's no human involvement and there hasn't been for at least two or 300 years. And it's like, that's a wake up call. It's like, like, <laughs> what are we doing wrong? If, 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 if these natural systems can do this with no fossil fuels, you know, no technology whatsoever, um, you know, we've got some lessons to learn. <laughs> absolutely yeah um the um one of the things I, I wanted to talk about a bit about too was um you know th there's there's this concept of you know upward spirals in that you know you know when you you know one plus one is four and you know you, you get a little bit of water and and it gets more grass and 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 then you can harvest more water and there's more so carbon in the soil and you get biodiversity brought in and that brings nutrients and but there you you talk about um the kind of positive feedback loops that are negative or like downward spirals mm -hmm. in places and particularly deserts where I passed a certain threshold that that natural capacity, which I was talking about like on our farm, where, you know, even for 200 years, our ecosystems have been getting more and more productive without any human intervention. But in places like, you know, Saudi Arabia, um, the, it's the opposite. Like when they're, if, if they're left to their own devices, they actually get worse and worse and worse. Yeah, um, but I don't think it was a matter in Saudi Arabia, I don't think it was a matter of the land left to its own devices. So, well, so, yeah, I, I mean, like, it was, like it, was, it was human intervention. Chopping down of the trees, right. Yeah, so like, but like, but like if, if, if humans intervene too far and, and, and then even if they stopped intervening and they went away, like right. it, it wouldn't just come back. And, and this is like, Basically, it's like talking about um, Savory's concept of brittleness. Right. The brittleness scale, which I yeah. think is one of the one of his biggest contributions is yeah. the understanding of the brittleness scale and and the important role, the ecological role of the breaking down of plant matter, mm -hmm. of decay. You know, decay isn't a very sexy topic. You know, watching something grow, yeah. you know, that's exciting, but decay is a really important part of the process. And when you have a very arid yeah. environment, if you lose the trees, which, you know, are associated with fun fungi and you, you know, like it, nothing gets broken down and you end up with totally bare soil. Yeah. And, and then it just keeps getting worse because, you know, the, the, um, I, you, you talk about how, like when it, um, when, uh, uh, th these these the dust that kind of blows in in the desert like it um uh it it has all these these negative consequences like once the soil dries out enough to the point where you know it becomes hydrophobic and then and even when it does rain it sheets off 
right and then and then the the dust uh, i think it was it was actually blowing um uh out into kind of the like it actually changed the weather systems in the area mm-hmm. because there was so much there was so much dust that was being created it was actually like chasing you know storms away it was that yeah, yeah, no, dust is a really important thing. And, you know, as we know, you know, then we, we get into the rain, the precipitation cycle. Yeah. And so, of course, we know that to form a raindrop, that water needs, that droplet needs to condense around something, okay? Yeah. But there are substances that create precipitation, you know, that are precipitation yeah. nuclei, yeah. you know, and those are, you know, ice crystals, salts, um, bacteria, um, you know, different substances that are cycling around in nature, mm-hmm. but dust particles are too small. So they kind of, yeah, kind of collect a haze. And so in many parts of the world, you get like this kind of moving haze that blocks precipitation yeah and and so it's again like once once those things happen there's a couple other other stories you tell in the book where um you know like the trees were cut down or something and you know like the winds actually reversed directions uh the prevailing winds and like the, right. the weather the weather system changed and, right so, so that's all hypothetical i mean that's okay. like when you're like you know c- connecting different historical yeah um you know passages i mean but it's it's fascinating yeah yeah so that's Thies van der Hoven's yeah work. yeah the weather makers <laughs> which yes. which just blew me away and the the, the phrase that i think i think you used it um in that section when you're talking about Thies was um he he his theory is like there are like acupuncture points on the planet um uh, which are like kind of uh, you know, key areas that if you were to jumpstart an ecosystem there, it, it could have, you know, a, a disproportionate a positive effect on on regenerating climate, you know, like basically like getting the, the prevailing wind directions to change. Right. Um, and like, so like, has he, like you mentioned that was hypothetical. Is he actively working on experiments to, to prove this theory or? Well, what they're doing is they are implementing this yeah. in Egypt. Okay. There is work happening now in the Sinai Peninsula, um, Lake Bardawil. Yeah. So you know, for for listeners, so um, so Tees is a really interesting character. He's Dutch, and his he he like sailed a lot as a child. So you know, he had a sense of kind of the movement of winds and, yeah. you know, and interactions with with nature and landscapes. And, you know, this was really new for me, because, you know, it isn't dredging is not something that would be kind of a field that many people I know are into, yeah. but in, in um, Belgium, and Holland, you know, that's like, a very big part of their economy. So he was in the dredging industry and through a colleague was concerned about this area, this lake in the Sinai Peninsula, which had like the water had lowered so much that the fish were dying, yeah. the rare turtles were dying, the people around it, because it was silting up, the people around it were impoverished because they could no longer make a living. So what if the dredging process was done there and you remove some of that organic material, build, use that ma- organic material to jump, st- to, so you'd clear the lake and yet that organic material could kind of jumpstart other like um, coastal agriculture, plant growth, and, you know, they figured all of this out, and, and, and they're, and he, he did, you know, work all this out scientifically, Uh that with, beyond a certain threshold of vegetation, that would allow for 
the winds to change and all, yeah. all of that. But that that's speculative. Yeah, but but I mean, like like if if you're to take um, I mean, like the way that it was presented in the book, like it it like it's it's just to- makes total sense. And um, and I mean, there's there's a lot of other you know just um, you know like the, the you know the trees effect on on prevailing wind patterns in terms of like they actually trees create their own orographic lift and there's there's right. it's been measured that there's more precipitation um you know after you know treed areas in the landscape than if, if there, there aren't trees and you know if, if you cut the trees down trees actually their evapotranspiration like as you mentioned they it gives off the bacteria that are perfect nuclei for um for uh, crystals for uh, precipitation and so like all this stuff makes sense but it's like I wonder how much money it would have cost to to implement that kind of a climate change mitigation program versus, you know, some kind of a stratospheric aerosol injection scheme or, uh, you know, pumping carbon via combustion engines down below the earth's crust. It's like, um, like both of those are, are, would be involved in, in mitigating climate change, but. uh, (laughs) Yeah. Well, what you're talking about, it's what John Liu calls ecological forensics. Okay. So what went wrong? What happened to alter this whole this region from a place that was green? You know, we know that there was a time the green Sahara yeah. to a desert. So yeah, what happened? Were there trees? What happened to those trees? Now, I yeah. think often it is complicated. You can you can create a very plausible narrative that is all what people did to the yeah. land. And but then there's also a positive narrative that it was the, you know, shift in the balance of the earth, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like the axis. So yeah. it's it's hard to know, but often one can. Yeah. You know, with the Los Plateau, you could do forensics and see what happened. And a lot has to do with clearing the hillsides. Yeah. Yes. And, and but I mean, like, but like, that's a situation where it's like, there's, there's almost no downside to doing that experiment. It's like, okay, worst case scenario, we plant all these trees. And if they don't change the wind direction, we still got a bunch of trees. <laughs> right. You know, it's like, there's, right. it's pretty, so, pretty asymmetric. Yeah, so 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 that's what they're working on, and I know that there is some really interesting work ha- happening in yeah. Egypt right now. And, and so the, 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 this is where there was another fellow you mentioned um, uh, in the book, Mayon M- Mayon. Yeah, that's how you say Mayon Mayon. Mayon yeah. Mayon, and the, he has this aphorism, uh, and I, I changed it a little bit just because the, the names that he used, I didn't recognize them, and so I figured other people might not recognize him. But he, he had this aphorism, which is cutting a tree in Spain um, could cause a storm in England. Or in Germany, right. Yeah, in Germany, right. yeah. Right, yeah. yeah, I think he said, you cut a tree in Almeria and you get a storm in Dusseldorf or Dusseldorf. something like that. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And, and so the, I mean, the, there's a guy who, um, I mean, the, this, this guy, he, you said he, he invented um, um, the um, uh, metal detectors in airports yes, and like all this other technology. And uh, I just got this, this image of this kind of mad scientist living in this apartment <laughs> building. <laughs> and, uh, and he's just, the, 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 if what he's talking about is true, which he's, he's looking at the relationship between, um, you know, ecosystems and their effect on the weather, um, you know, tying that back into that, you know, um, uh, Tisa's observations about finding these acupuncture points in the landscape that could, that could create positive changes in climate. Right. Um, like, yeah, I guess, can you speak a little bit about Mayon Mayon's work and, and is he, is he working on any projects? Has he had any success there to, to prove kind of some of these theories that he has? Um, I think mostly, you know, he's, he's a scholar researcher. He's, he's more, an inspiration, you know, he's like an elder, you know, he's yeah. in his mid late seventies now. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, I got to spend some time with him and wow. And he's got a real healthy cynicism about him. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so he's just this incredible scientist who's a meteorologist a um, volcano specialist. He invented 
the system to anticipate when volcanoes uh, are yeah. going to happen and it like plumes. Um, yeah, so he's done all kinds of things. And the thing is that he's been around long enough to see how scientific fashion changes. Okay. So he saw that there was a time in the 1970s when people were coming to understand that changes in land use had an impact on climate. Oh yeah, yeah. But then everything became about carbon. Yeah. So he's held on to this knowledge yeah. and sort of shaken his head as this knowledge has been forgotten. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that that part in the book you talk about the like yeah scientific articles that were written like you said in the nineteen seventies that they they'd figured all this stuff out and they'd given plans about like how to reverse it, and you know was it fifty years have gone by? Right. So he's held on to that. Yeah. The 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 line of inquiry. Yeah. Of what happens when, um, you know how does what we do to the land affect the weather? So he lives in Valencia, Spain, which is on the Mediterranean. So he's looking at this region, the Western Mediterranean, and how when he was growing up, there were always storms every day, that there was a pattern that you'd get yeah. the, you know, the day would heat up and then a storm would come in and then it would, you know, the kind of uncomfortable heat that humidity would dissipate, the air would feel fresh and the farmers would have the rain they need, needed. So this was predictable mm -hmm. and you could watch the clouds come in and how over the decades, trees have been removed on the coast and marsh land had been turned to agricultural land. So yeah. the vegetation had been removed and you know, there'd been hotels, you know, the, the, just there was a lot of what we call development, yeah. you know, a lot of building. Coast, yeah. yeah, and that meant that inland, the storms don't happen anymore. Yeah. And that has meant that people aren't farming there and you know it, it's yeah. but he he has been his research has been about making the connection between the loss of vegetation and the loss of the rains yeah yeah and so i mean that's this is kind of a good segue into um in in the middle of the book you you have this little kind of interlude um about where you discuss your your epiphany um where you realize that um information is no longer enough to, to create the changes. Like we just said, like in the 1970s, there was, there was scientific research that, that proved, you know, this kind of uh, agricultural, uh, you know, land practices has this, these kinds of negative effects. Um, and, you know, we see all these benefits all around the world. And yet it's, it's, we're still kind of not getting the, the traction that you would think, like, you know, people are even in, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in the Lost Plateau where, um, where just for you know p pennies a, a day they were able to to you know regenerate millions of acres of land um you know in in, in nearby regions they're they're not mimicking the same practices as like it hasn't kind of caught on and so i, I just wanted you to, to discuss like what 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 um why is information not enough and what's what's the missing piece to create this kind of uh, cultural change that we need as quickly as possible. Right. Well, I'll just, you know, refer to, you know, Mian Mian being cynical. He said that we can, that the, the carbon focus kind of serves us because, you know, we collectively can go to meetings and talk about carbon all the time and nothing ever happens. Whereas if you're dealing with, no, you can't build a hotel there, you know, yeah. that's getting, very very real yeah and that is inconvenient yeah because our whole economic system <laughs> is all about growth and you know that's a whole other a yeah. whole other thing but the epiphany i mean i'm embarrassed because it's totally obvious 
that information isn't enough. Whereas, you know, I was the journalist with my notepad thinking all I have to do is just get this, these stories out. Mm -hmm. um, that it's, we're dealing with human nature and people's fear of change, people's desires and wanting, you know, just all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And and us versus them and and all of those things and egos and this is my land, it's not your land and this is the way my grandfather did it so I'm not going to change or well, I guess it would probably be better if I did that but if I did that then my neighbors might look at me funny and I don't wanna go down to the cafe and you know sit by myself. Yeah. So all these human things that <laughs> get us stuck yeah yeah so um yeah yeah so so what's what's the you, you present some some really interesting kind of solutions or, or systems that are helping to overcome those barriers um yeah can you just highlight some of those well yeah so i guess like the really advanced technology there is called listening <laughs> <laughs> um so it was really it was kind of serendipitous that as I'm sitting there having this, you know, kind of, you know, crisis of like, oh my gosh, maybe just writing these stories of, you know, getting the information out isn't enough. You know, what do I do now? I run into this person that I had heard about before that does this consensus work yeah. and did a little trial with that. And that sparked my interest. And then I went and took part in a th three day long workshop where I literally watched a community move from fear, um, sabotage, literally sh gunfire. Yeah. Um, you know, People saying, I'm not bringing my children to that land because I don't trust anyone up there. Going from this really dark place to committing to work together to improve this land. I mean, mm -hmm. I saw it happen in three days. Wow. And it was incredible. So this was this was Jeff Goebel's consensus work, which involved listening to each other. I mean, he guided us through the, through this and he had different, like different kind of interventions, like when it became clear. So this is a community in New Mexico that's really degraded land, families that are living or that have, it's, it's Bureau of Land Management land in the US, which means it's kind of owned by the government, but people whose families have been there for hundreds of years have like grazing allotments. Yeah. And then there is a little town there. Um, so it was all about the water. It was all about the pump house. Who has access to the pump house? Because there are the ranchers and there are the townspeople. And at that moment, the ranchers were suing the townspeople. The townspeople were suing the ranchers. The townspeople were suing themselves. I never understood how they were suing themselves, but you know, it was this big mess. And you know, they were spending thousands of dollars on lawsuits and everybody was miserable. And the Bureau of Land Management was tired of having all of their personnel have to work out these quarrels constantly. And this is, you know, this is New Mexico. There's a lot of land. And so like the distances that the staff had to go to keep, you know, working on it. Um, yeah, so he, he had these interventions. So the last day, I, I mean, I was in suspense the whole time. I had no idea how this was gonna work out. Selfishly, I hoped it worked out because I wanted a good story, you know, <laughs> like, but, um, yeah. you know, um, but, I didn't know. So one intervention he had at the end was the person that was kind of the represent the like the person in charge of the of the town water and the person in charge of the rancher's pump house. He brought them into like out together. Like we had been in little groups, and then he brought them together. And what he did was he had each of them had a list like a listener. Yeah. And so 
the listener who in both cases were, you know, not volatile people. They were women, you know, because you balance different kinds of energy. <laughs> and, and so they would say, this is what I, I heard you say mm -hmm. that what is important to you is that people trust and know that you have the community's interest at heart, you know, like, you yeah. know, what, or what I heard from you is what you fear more than anything mm -hmm. is that people you grew up with have no trust in you. Yeah. And that's, yeah. So, wow. so it was, he created this like little constellation. So there were lots of these different kinds of interventions that he did to create scenarios where people who would not be inclined to listen to each other felt comfortable in doing so. Yeah. And, and that's, I'm just thinking of a, a quote that um, Bill Molson said, and I, I've, I've never used it in this context before, usually has to do with like, you know, how simple it is to repair ecosystems. But his quote is the, although the, the um, world's problems are increasingly complex, the solutions are embarrassingly simple. And it's just like, yeah, we just need to listen to each other. Yeah. I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, that's really powerful work and it's, it's not easy. I mean, no. you know, I wrote in the book that even, you know, as a, I wasn't terrible as invested in the process as other people were, it, but you know, I, I was, I was there, but you know, there was a tedium to it, you know, you get yeah. tired of listening and tired of hearing the same thing and, yeah. oh gosh, get over it. And, you know, but yeah. you, you do it and yeah. the pieces come together somehow. Yeah. And so the, how, like, how was, how was the kind of follow-up of that, that initial three-day workshop? Uh, like when, when did that take place? That consensus workshop? That was in April of 2018. Okay. And yeah. from what I understand now, and this was one of the most interesting things is that what, one thing that I found tedious is that I was interested in the land. <laughs> so, you know, I wasn't as interested like in this guy and this guy were mad at each other. You know, I didn't know, you know, I didn't, I mean, it was sort of interesting for the drama and you do get, yeah. you know, kind of, you know, you pick up the characters. It's like, it's, but, it's like Jerry Springer for farmers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but I wanted like, well, when are we going to bring the land into this? Yeah. But the last day, the afternoon after that pivotal conversation with the two listeners, Jeff showed a brief film about holistic management. Yeah. And it, it didn't make a big introduction, you know, didn't say, well, now that we got that out of the way, let's look at different practices that can improve our landscapes. He just yeah. said, you know, we're tired. Just, just watch this. These are some people I know. You might find this interesting. Yeah. And, but what happened was after a month or so, when people, I guess that he had a few follow-up, very brief follow-up meetings that I didn't attend because I'm over here in Vermont, but people said they wanted to learn how to do that. Okay. So some of the people that were the most contentious, the most saying, no one ever cares about me and you know and and this is what i want actually started doing field days and hosting <laughs> workshops on holistic management so you know that's that's the last i heard you know every once in a while jeff will send me something but you know i haven't been in touch with him for a couple of months now so i i don't know but that was the direction it was heading yeah it's it's so funny it's just like the one of our kind of models on the farm is like heal yourself, heal the planet. And it's this kind of like duality because like, like humans are in no doubt you know, destroying the planet's ecosystem. There's no doubt about it. And, and, but we also ha have the ability to heal the planet's ecosystems, but we can't do it if we're sick, like if we're malnourished or if we are, you know, dealing with, with depression or, or, um, you know, just intergenerational trauma, like that community was obviously going through. And, but it's like, but it's, there's the, like when, so when we, when we heal ourselves, we get better at healing the planet. And when the planet gets healthier, we get healthier. And it's like this, this ratcheting up or this upward spiral. And, um, but it, it's so, yeah, like the, that, the, the emotional 
um, you know, spiritual, you know, philosophical piece. Um, you know, I teach a lot of workshops as well. And nobody ever wants to talk about that. You know, the goal setting, the decision making. They just want to learn about how do I build swales? How do I do, you know, subsoiling? How do I do rotational grazing? And it's like, that stuff is so easy. It's so trivial. And, and it's, it's not the weak link. Like, the, you yeah. know, it's, um, but like you said, you, you, you kind of, you have to meet people where they're at. And I was actually really interested um, in the consensus work because this is also a, a major barrier um, that, that I've, I've seen. And I've developed some of my own kind of approaches in, in getting over it, but um, I'm really interested in, in actually diving into the consensus work myself and, and figuring out what their process is because it's, yeah, it's, it's the, it's the weak link right now in this, um, this regeneration work. Yeah. Yeah. No, Jeff does great work and he is very willing to, uh, I can send you information to have workshops for people to introduce the process to people. Cool. Yeah. 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 But it sounds like they do online work as well. Like online workshops or online training? Yeah. Or? Well, well, now yeah. you know that wasn't that wasn't the intent. <laughs> yeah, everybody switched to yeah. 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 yeah so did we. Um, so in in um, uh, one one of the projects you mentioned before we got started here, uh, Judith was um, you you're working on something called the the What We Measure Media Initiative. Can you, uh, it sounds like you're really excited about this project. I, I, I told you to push pause because I wanted <laughs> to, to hear about it live on the, the podcast. So can you um, tell folks about what that is? Well, it's interesting the way you put it is what is the weak link? Okay. okay. So here I am. I've written, I've written these books. Okay. Do I want to run? How can I, how can I best serve the goal of restoring the earth. And I was thinking, yeah, okay, I'm a storyteller. I can tell these stories. Yeah. I was starting to feel that just telling individual stories is chipping away at the edges. Okay. How about if we shift kind of how we tell stories? So I'm talking about the media, I'm yeah. okay? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a member of the media yeah. You know, I mean, came, I came through all of this from as a journalist. And, okay, so this goes back to my long history of yelling back at the radio. Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I, I do that as well. <laughs> so, yeah. So when I, so I came to writing about soil and water and eco restoration from writing a period of when I was writing about new economics. Okay. And I would, which is an understanding that the economy should serve people and the planet instead of the people and the planet existing to serve this yeah. kind of insatiable, you know, gaping maw of the economy. <laughs> so, you know, it used to, so I would yell back at the, you know, at the radio, just, you know, everything's about growth and this and that, like, and say, and say, why, why at the top of our newscast, is it always the stock market, yeah. you know, the GDP, you know, that like, they'd have met, you know, like these metrics, like, and mortgage backed securities are up or down. And like, why are we here? You know, why do we hear about this? when we know that what happens to the earth is much more important than these daily fluctuations. But that's telling us the message that that is important. That's who we are. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I have long had this fantasy of, you know, what if instead we had ecological metrics? Now, what happened was I um, had a conversation with the leadership of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Okay. Um, specifically, the communications manager, um, a wonderful young woman named Anne Catherine. And, you know, we kind of riffed on this and it was kind of like, well, heck yeah, you know, and I thought, well, what if, you know, we developed these metrics of, of ecological restoration, you know, like, like 10,000 acres of grasslands were brought back to ecological function this past month. I mean, that's kind of cool. Mm, so oh, yeah, yeah. you know like and, and it's like the, the dow jones is up 10 10 000 points right you know, right the, the the carbon levels in in you know nebraska are up 10 percent yeah right yeah so so let's yeah so let's bring that in so we've been playing with that and then 
I um, did a webinar with um, someone named Dale Willman, who runs the Resilience Media Project at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. And we talked and he had the same idea. So we're working together on this idea. I, I'm just going to read our mission statement, which is all of two sentences, okay? Sure. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So the mission is to create a paradigm shift in how journalists report on the state of the world so that daily indicators of ecological vitality replace the economic measurements that currently dominate, such as the stock market and GDP. Amplifying restoration metrics and narratives supports the goals of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. In other words, let's heal the earth. You know, so bringing these stories to the fore, getting people involved, you know, because when you hear about the stock market all the time, you come to think that that has relevance to you when in fact, if anyone was in this business, there are much more nuanced, you know, figures than what you hear on the radio. So yeah. it's just kind of like a, you know, it's just kind of like a cue, like of, of telling us what matters. Yeah. So um, anyway, so this is where we are. And, you know, what I was saying is that I'm fine. So this is new to me, new to me is doing, I mean, you know, I, I'm finding all kinds of amazing metrics out there, the daily erosion index, you know, all, all these incredible things. What I'm finding is that a lot of it is like the process of writing a book. So you, you get to a point, like a surface point, like, okay, yeah, I get it. I get exactly what it's going to be. And then it's like, oh, and then you got to go deep. Yeah. So now I'm now I'm in, in that kind of uncomfortable going deep moment of what have other what have people what have been the deep thinking about indicators. Yeah. So I'm reading um, Danella Meadows work because yeah. she had written a paper yes. critiquing like what kind of indicators would help lead us to a society that we want. Yeah. So that's where I am right now. That's, we're going to do this. That's really interesting. So um, one of the, uh, the, 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 the book that, that my colleagues and I just wrote, um, it's called Building a Permaculture Property, a Five-Step Process to Design Develop Land. One of our five-step process is called Monitor. It's the, it's the fifth, if it's the fifth process. And <clears throat> there's, there's essentially two, uh, there's two things that you're, you're trying to monitor for. And it's it's suffering and well being, and it's like it's and so like well, how do we it's from from a human perspective how do we how can we measure suffering and well being, um, from from our for ourselves but also because we are dependent upon these ecosystems it's like how can we measure the suffering and well being of our ecosystems, and so the um, one of the exercises that we we get kind of people to to well for the ecosystems we focus on the savories um, the four ecosystem processes so uh, you know sunlight water soil and organisms like flora and fauna and you know just looking at the, um, there's there's just fantastic work that like guys like Bruce um, Bruce Ward has done on um, you know just like indicators that ecosystems are improving or they're they're going down. Um, but even the, that, that one's been done pretty, pretty good. Um, but then there's, there's the, the, the human kind of like your personal well, uh, suffering and wellness indicators. And so I, one of the exercises we get people to do is like, like what are the, the earliest signs that you look for, like the patterns in yourself, whether you're humming or whether you're, you know, picking your nails or you're, you're, you have a short temper or you can't sleep, or you, you wake up and you've been grinding your teeth all night. It's like, what are those early indicators that you're either kind of moving up or you're moving down? And we're also doing this on like a, on a daily, we have a little um, uh, uh, planner that's like every day you're like charting these, these indicators so you can, you can track them for yourself and you start to have notice patterns of like, you know, what, what is it that's really bugging me? And, and these just little things. Um, and so it's, it's, it's funny how you're talking about, there's all these different people who are like, oh, I had that idea. I had that idea too. <laughs> and it's kind of like going back to, you know, there was, there was two people that were working on the theory of evolution at the same time. And uh, maybe there's a bit of synchronicity there, but I, I absolutely agree with you. Like we, we need to have, um, indicators it's like I don't know what the saying is you, you can't um you can't manage what you don't measure mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and we are absolutely focused 
in the wrong direction, measuring things that, that have no intrinsic value to us. They're means to an end. Money doesn't do anything. No one's ever got to the end of their life and said, oh man, I wish I made more money. It's always, I wish I spent more time with my family. I wish I spent more, you know, creative time doing this or, or, you know, learning these new skills or whatever it is, but we don't measure those things. And it's just, yeah. Right. And the thing with the, with the media is that that's how society reflects itself. Yeah. Reflects itself back to itself. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, you're absolutely right. It's like, that's, um, you know, the role, like the, you, you refer to yourself as a storyteller, which I, I is, is a, um, that role in the, in the culture is so important because like you said, you're, you're that mirror that can, um, in a gentle way, <laughs> kind of, um, you know, uh, tell a story, a compelling story that creates behavior change. And, um, and right now it's, you know, it's being used to basically, you know, reinforce, negative behavior that's we all know where it's heading and um but it doesn't have to be used that way right yeah um well i think that's a that's a a good place to to end judith where um so where can people find out more information about uh, all the amazing projects you've you've done in the past and and you know this this new one that you're working on right now um my website which is just very plain old judithdschwartz.com and i'm on twitter and yeah i'm I'm around i'm also available i mean people can always write to me i always write back i'm i'm i was surprised how available you were when when i asked you to be in the well we we crossed paths on um the regeneration canada um conference and and i just threw it out there and i yeah i was i was pleasantly surprised how uh how available you were and also how uh uh amenable you were to the three or four scheduling changes i had to make because because <laughs> stuff is getting crazy here on the farm but um oh, i'm sure yeah well the so i'll, I'll put a, a link to that in the description of um of the podcast and or video if folks want to go check out to that um, any any closing thoughts or uh, there, Judith? No, it's all good. But you know, I'm, I'm seeing you know our time difference is that you know <laughs> evenings happening here and you're yeah. still yeah you're still, I can see right? the, the sun changing there. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for just all the amazing work that you've done and like, this this book is a real gem. I, honestly, it's it's. Um, it's for anybody on any level, whether you're kind of just getting into this or, you know, you've been doing this your whole life. There's, there's so many insights and inspiration that you can gain from it. And um, yeah, I'm sure it was a, a, a lengthy process to write. And I, I just really appreciate it. Oh, sure. Well, my pleasure. <laughs> I enjoyed talking to you. Okay. Take care, Judith. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.